my name is Ragnar Grippe, and I'm a composer. Why do I make this podcast um, these days? Um, one of the reason is actually that I wanted to tell those interested in um, how I perceive electroacoustic music and also why I have uh, done what I've done. First of all, I would like to say that um, it started out for me when I was listening to a lot of the text sound compositions which were available in our home when I was a kid and uh, which were given to my father who was a radio producer at uh, the Swedish National Radio and I started listening to those and uh, understood that I mean they were extremely interesting without actually finding them interesting but um, the word that got spread was actually saying that I mean this was interesting stuff um, Then I heard quite a lot of electronic music and I thought it sounded extremely bad and I could not figure out how come that so much money was spent on a music that actually did not convey any more feelings or, or for me at least, um, feelings of quality and musicality and so forth. I was to be proven wrong, that for sure. Um, then, um, when entering the the uh, university in Stockholm after having been playing cello for quite some time, and I entered the conservatory in Stockholm when I was only 14 years old, which meant that I was among people which were my, were my peers um, uh, with about 10 years um, of age, and uh, I was doing my music and then. Uh, for about four years and I understood that I was never going to make it as a uh, soloist, cellist and um, I also had an urge to actually uh, make music um, one of the reasons was probably also that I was playing in a band um, just for fun and we never, almost never actually appeared on stage but we were playing and uh, it wasn't too bad and that gave me the reason and also the, um, the the feeling for for composing which actually then led into me being more and more interested in electronic music when I had the chance to write a thesis um, not at all not at all a PhD thesis but but um, a thesis um, or an abstract um, at the University of Stockholm uh, where I studied for one year musicology and uh, not knowing exactly where I was heading. During that time, when I went to do this abstract or thesis, um, which I uh, was given the opportunity to actually do from the viewpoint of the Electronic Music Studio in Stockholm, that was 1972. Um, it was, at the time, maybe one of the absolutely most, um, most uh, elaborate and uh, and uh, highly sophisticated computerized studios um, or studio in the world at the time and I thought this is quite interesting I understood very quickly that I mean you couldn't do much with um, with the uh, different kind of, of uh, uh, inputs that you had to type and uh, actually you had to to um, to put in a lot of code in order to have music heard. So there were people who were sitting typing for about three days and after three days they went in and put that sprocket tape into, I mean, the, the wheels that actually then handled them and went through some kind of reader and the sound that came out was like... <laughs> then they looked up in the ceiling, down at the floor and then went back to typing again. I thought that that is not possible for me to actually work that way because if I get a commission, if I ever get a commission, maybe that was not even in my head at the time, but but I I thought that is not possible because, I mean, if you don't know exactly what's coming out and you have to wait three days to have like 10 seconds of material, then I can't make it. It won't work.
people. So what's going on here in this whole situation? The difference between the old school, so to speak, the uh, reel-to-reel tape capturing via mics the sounds, go into the buckler synthesizer where you had the ba- the patch bay, and uh, in order to get the sounds you wanted to work with, you used the patch bay, lots of cords, lots of cables, and it was quite, I mean, an ordeal to uh, grasp the enormity of this instrument. But at the same time, you had the feeling that you were dealing with an instrument exactly as you are when you're playing the cello or a flute or a piano. It was something that you had in front of you, and it was that instrument that you worked with. Today, what a difference. I mean, I have, first of all, a DAW. I'm using Digital Performer, and uh, I have had it now for almost 20 years. And um, to Digital Performer, I have a vast array of different kinds of plugins, different instruments that are directly... Um, linkable to the sequencer and I can use them directly inside the computer. It's not that kind of big rack system studio that one used to have. And more and more of my old synths, unfortunately, they go old and they die. I mean, I can't get the uh, spare parts for all of them and uh, to change. The thing is that over the years, um, the enormity of the access to sound uh, that has uh, shaped the music industry um, is both uh, a pro and con situation. I think it's a pro situation because naturally you can use a lot of different types of, uh, of sounds or also gestures if you take samples or if you make your sounds yourself or you, you make them from 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 different samples or if you make them from different kinds of of um, sine wave generators with different kinds of waveforms and so forth you have incredible amount of sounds at your disposal thing is at the same time with a bookla i only had the bookla and i was just sitting there with that instrument in front of me and 
it was the one where I did my work. Today is like, hmm, which one should I take today? Which instrument? Um, which which unit producing those different sounds? And there are a lot. There are a lot of different manufacturers, and they're all good. And certain of them have their benefits. In certain regions, other ones have them in all of them, and so forth. But it's like everything. I mean, you want different spices in life. Compose music, to me it's been quite a journey to be able to both compose for dance, modern dance, when I was in Paris, and for film, and then the, if we call it pure electroacoustic music. Also the instrumental music has meant a lot to me, and uh, it's been phases of um, my production that has been dealing with different kinds of, of music at different times mostly be t- depending on whether I had commissions for dance which naturally do, uh, then um, made it more of uh, dance music for, for a couple of years and then the film and also the electroacoustic but the electroacoustic music I would say is probably what has been uh, consistent uh, through the years um, the first composition which I composed um, is actually also available on record um, on the BIS label, uh, B-I-S, and um, uh, that piece is Capriccio. And Capriccio I wrote um, in the midterm uh, at GRM in Paris, the home for the musique concrète, the uh, music with captured sounds from mics. Capriccio uses what was very easily available in the studios at that time, uh, namely a big piano and where you could scratch the strings and work with them different ways, cut the tape. Um, Naturally, we're talking now 2011 when I record this, but this is 1972 and uh, this is almost 40 years ago and uh, then there was no such a thing like a computer or a DAW for your recording process cutting splicing and then also taking those tapes and uh, making what is called in French for mélange which means that you blend two different sounds in order to achieve a completely new type of sound or you have the mixage which means that you have distinctive different sources which can then be blended together and where you are not considering them as being a new sound but actually distinctive different sources. Also, one has to remember that at that time, even in Stockholm, um, I did have more uh, to my uh, disposal in the studio than I had at GRM in Paris because when we started, 
as students in Paris, um, we had first access only to monophonic tape decks. And I'll tell you one thing, that having access to a monophonic tape deck sounds today maybe very strange when we have surround sounds and uh, we have, I mean, multi-channel and so forth. But it also gave you the possibility to focus on the sound to give you an idea about what was the quality, inherent quality of the sound and how could I actually uh, tweak it? How could I uh, change it? What kind of possibilities did I have at hand? While we did not have a lot of external devices to actually alter the sounds, usually what one had was actually things like filters and we also had reverb. That was about it. Delay came much later. If you take a piece like Chamber Music, also available on Abyss Record, um, that is an example of how you could actually compose and work without having access to a big, big studio. It was actually made or composed in my um, studio in uh, Paris, overlooking Ile Saint-Louis, facing south, so it was sometimes as hot that you could sit in a t-shirt on the balcony in Paris in the month of March. In that studio, which actually, when you say studio, it means in French, it means like a, a one-room flat, and um, uh, where you have a little kitchenette and you have a little bathroom and a big balcony outside. In that room, I had my Rebox Swiss tape deck, and I had a good pair of speakers. I had also a very good um, amplifier and good mics. What I did was actually, after having spent a lot of time over at the opera, because friends of my parents had been over to uh, to uh, France to sing at the opera at a big production in Parsifal by Wagner, and uh, um, by that I became intensely interested in uh, the Wagner music, which I hadn't listened to as much as I did during those days. This also brought me certain of the parts of the Wagner Parsifal recording to be sampled and um, where you can hear certain of those sounds being processed in the background in this chamber music. In chamber music, in order to achieve a filtering experience, while I did not have any filters, what I took was actually a plywood um, sheet and um, I kind of... um, held it above the speakers while having record mode on one channel and then I flung that plywood over the speaker to actually open up the sound and close it down and it gave me the very strange type of filtering effect. This is just a little image about how I felt about working and how one dealt with the um, actually I would say it was not like you were 
thinking that I should have had this and that in order to do what I want to do. It was more, I have this, what can I do with it? And I did chamber music, for example. Buckle a synthesizer. A monster took time, time to actually uh, understand how it worked. But I used it for so many different things. The buckle synthesizer I used for, for example, um, new dance pieces. I will play you an excerpt in a minute. And I also did it for a film, which um, was my first feature movie um, named The Emperor, and which was released 1979 in Sweden. And it also got a silver beer at the Berlin Festival for the photography that year. The instrument was incredibly difficult to deal with when you wanted to have a, a tuned instrument because, I mean, it got detuned after maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, which meant that you had to stop recording, you had to reset everything, you had to, had to tune it so you could continue with the recording. Naturally, then any quantize, which everybody knows today what it is, or the groove or whatsoever, all these different enhancements which are found in any kind of sequence program today naturally did not exist. The only way to have a rhythmical experience of this music was to uh, have a click track and uh, to which one played and which was not recorded. Or, as in my case, since I did not have access to very uh, multi-track um, uh, tape decks, I only had four what I did was actually that I lay down a, um, not a groove, but, you know, um, a rhythm which was uh, almost not discernible. You could not hear it almost, but it was like... And it went in the background, and to that I played on the second and third and fourth channel. Another thing that was interesting, you had all this with noise reduction systems. And noise reduction systems um, was something I did not want to use. Why? Only because I thought that in a couple of years they will be obsolete and then you will have all your recordings done with the noise reduction system and you have to convert them into a different kind of noise reduction system and you will lose a lot of quality. Uh, my plan or my uh, solution to this was actually to always have something very, very silent in the background. This is the time when we still are recording on tape, right? And the tape gave a lot of hiss. And as soon as you had a new copy, you had more hiss. And if you made another copy, you had even more hiss and so forth. What happened was actually that I, I, I composed in such a way that I had a very silent or a, something going on in the background, like a drop um, in, in the back that actually shielded or covered the hiss that otherwise would be there. The hiss naturally is there, but you can't hear it because you hear the sounds that I composed. Then on top of that, then I had the composition and what was happening. This also led me to focus more and more on what is today maybe called the virtual acoustics. Why was that? That was only because I thought that when you can give a sound a um, certain type of room in which it lives, so to speak, then you have already established the uh, 
acoustics of that sound. But what if you then insert or bring in a different sound which is coming from a different kind of room? Then you have two different rooms at the same time, something which is physically impossible in real life. If I'm standing in a cathedral and I have somebody standing in front of me talking to me, naturally I will hear that sound pretty clear. But I will still also take in the acoustics of the complete cathedral. If somebody is dropping a key or a coin in another part of the cathedral in which I am at the same time, then I will hear probably a very faint sound from this coin falling down on the uh, stone floor. But I will have exactly the same kind of reverberation and the same kind of room to which my ears have adjusted as I had when I was talking to somebody who was standing in front of me. This was the beginning of something which has thrilled me through the years to actually try to combine and also address certain acoustic events in different rooms followed by each other in order to make our head spin. I don't know if I succeeded, but it has been a very interesting journey to see how we can actually play with acoustics. Ladies and gentlemen, the show may start.
that uh, the time in Paris where I had also the possibility to work in the Look Ferrari studio. Look Ferrari, one of the absolutely most notorious electroacoustic composers, invited me to um, help him to uh, make his studio uh, very close to Place Mouffetard in uh, Paris 5th arrondissement. Um, And this also gave me the possibility to outside the GRM studio uh, which actually was accessible only for a certain amount of time per per student um, gave me an opportunity to actually work on my own in his studio when he wasn't there um, not much of um, equipment but we had um, three different Revox tape decks and uh, electric organ there were also kind of um, almost toy instruments, uh, guitar and uh, some other instruments, which, I mean, percussion instruments like a tambourine and so forth. But um, in that place, I composed the music, which is uh, also available on a record, it was available on a record, on the well-known um, record company label Shandar. And uh, Shandar was known for a lot of music with uh, Lamont Young, uh, with um, Terry Riley, among others. And uh, then there was me coming in on 1977. Uh, The label doesn't exist any longer, but uh, it was also reissued, Sand at least, uh, was reissued by a German record label, Streamline, um, in uh, the 1990s. And um, it seems like there aren't any more records out in longer. music which I composed in the studio uh, was once again very much dependent on what was not in the studio. That is to say the same thing as I mentioned before that um, I was not hoping to have, I mean, the mega studio with all the accessories that were uh, available to pop musicians in big productions and so forth. It was more a question of this joy of being in a studio and having an instrument or or equipment with which you could actually do things that you never had heard before. 
and uh, I can only remember all this time with a lot of joy for the uh, process of of recording the music, the splicing, the splicing, the the um, pasting of of different segments of the tape and so forth. Naturally, still with reel to reel tape decks and nothing more, and um, that also gave the music a certain character. I'm not talking about audio, but um, about the complexity and so forth. Then came much, much later. Um, now we're talking like three years later. That's not much, much when we're talking about a span of music now, which is ranging from 38 years from 1973 to 2011 when this is recorded. I spoke about Capriccio before, and uh, Capriccio was the first, if we call it, um, real composition, which also I mean, became more real because, I mean, also was issued on, on the BIS uh, uh, record label. But 1980, in Stockholm, where I uh, went back to Stockholm very often in the summers, uh, during my time in Paris, which lasted almost 22 years, I came back to Stockholm and worked at the electronic music studio in Stockholm, where actually everything had started for me. In 1980, the uh, studio had gotten a 24-track tape deck, an MCI, and it was the first time I had a chance to work with a multi-track machine for a composition which was, until then, in my head, an electroacoustic composition. I think this is also the reason why, if we use a term like a pure electroacoustic composition, meaning that the sounds are all mic'd or some of them electronically generated, but talking about uh, music which has very few harmonic or melodic ingredients that was not any longer the case when I got my hands on the 24 track the first piece I composed on that machine or with that machine um, is called orchestra and orchestra was first featured in the Stockholm Electronic Music Festival in 1980 I dedicated this piece to my then just 1979 deceased father and um, it's uh, composed in his memory this piece is called as I said orchestra and orchestra is a name because I would say that maybe for a long time I had this idea about having the electroacoustic music I don't want to say substitute the orchestra but to borrow the idea of the orchestra in the sense that there are so many different instruments so much happening so many different layers of sound which go in the same direction or in opposite directions and how that could actually become a completely new oral experience I don't know if it became a big oral experience but I remember that some people were pretty surprised when they heard the music.
Stravinsky, when people have asked me, who has influenced you? And I must say that Stravinsky, more than anybody else, um, in many different ways. First of all, I think that his inclusion of rhythm in uh, Rite of Spring, for example, was such a bold move at a time when everybody was very much in the same kind of tradition, writing tradition. He actually lent his eye to the jazz musicians and at that time jazz was not something that was recognized as real music. And he brought it into the concert auditorium and um, I think that already there it's something which is amazing. Naturally what is amazing is the result, the musical result. And what I like very much in Stravinsky's, mu Stravinsky's music is the energy, um, the rhythm, and also the fast changes. I think maybe I have borrowed that philosophy to a certain extent. There's one piece which I know that I have a citation of a couple of notes. It's from the Psalm Symphony by Stravinsky, which actually occurs in my orchestra. Those notes are in my orchestra. That's the only thing I ever knowledgeably have cited from anybody else. And uh, if anybody can find anything else, then tell me. Um, to my knowledge, nothing else. Anyhow, I mentioned Symphony of Psalms, and Symphony of Psalms is also so fantastic because it's so different from the Rite of Spring or the Firebird or uh, Linus or something else by Stravinsky. And um, I just recently understood that um, Stravinsky, during the 1920s, mid-20s, uh, experience a, a very strong religious um, feeling for life and, and, and also starting questioning um, the life as he knew it at that time and which also is one of the reasons why this symphony of psalms which I think is extremely beautiful and very touching and moving um, was written I think that there are many, many other musicians that have, in different ways, inspired me. But at the same time, I must say that I have not been the person who is listening to a lot of other music in order to know what to do myself. I, I have almost wanted, maybe this is strange, this is maybe absolutely crazy, but, but I wanted to stay free of too many types of influences um, because I, I have wanted to maintain some kind of direction which hopefully can be seen in my work over the years um, um, a direction which is uh, coherent and that can be felt if you listen to Musique Douze from 2006, my first real commission from the National Swedish Radio. What's such a blast. It was the first time when I thought, wow, I can get money for this. The only thing was that at that time, <clears throat> it was like, I thought it was extra money, but naturally, I mean, after a certain time, I understood that this money is what you are living on, man. And that was hard, but it was my first commission. Music douze using cello, which is my instrument, which I played. And after that, having piano sounds, a lot of energy. And if you take that and listen to, for example, my latest piece, which was finished two days ago when I speak, which is called Cold Numbers. <laughs>
Thank you for staying with me this far, and um, I hope you have enjoyed it. I'm trying to give you a little bit of an inside view into these different compositions, which have been ranging so far from electroacoustic music to uh, modern dance with symphonic songs and also to feature music. Um, I will mention which pieces were played, and uh, the first one is uh, Le Mécanicien Euphrené, which is uh, the wild mechanic in translation to English. Um, then we have Musique Douze, which means music number 12, actually my 12th composition. Then we have Capriccio, one of my absolutely early compositions, which is available on the BIS label. Chamber Music, same thing goes for that one, composed in my studio in Paris, 1975. Then The Emperor, from the feature movie The Emperor, and uh, which has been recorded on a Buchla synthesizer, which I also speak about. And uh, that was uh, composed in 1979. Symphonic songs followed, and that is actually a modern dance piece. Then we have Sand, composed and recorded in the Luc Ferrari studio, very close to Place Mouffetard in the Parisian arrondissement number 5. Then we have Orchestra, my first piece with the 24-track tape deck, and uh, composed in Stockholm at the EMS studio. And the last one is the only one week old, as we speak, composition Cold Numbers, a 52 minute long stereo and also surround piece, which will eventually be available on iTunes and other platforms. Thank you so much for staying with me. And I hope to be able to come back about the following 80s and 90s and you know what's following that. Thank you. Bye-bye.